This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. A very good afternoon and jumbo jumbo everybody and everyone and welcome to a sunset safari drive and we are all the way in Kenya in the great Masai Mara Triangle. That is what we call the Ololo Escarpment that forms one side of the boundary of the Mara Triangle and beautiful cliffs, hills, trees and nice opening of the Savannah Plains. My name is David and on camera today is Manu. Good afternoon, Manu. Very exciting to be with Manu after a couple of days. I've been away home and Manu also has been away home and we came two days apart back. No, we came the same day apparently back to work. And please feel free to ask us questions as we show hashtag Safari Live. Should you have any comments also, send it through. And it's so exciting to start watching or looking for baboons from a distance. And instead of baboons, I was expecting to see the wildebeest because the migration is still on. But now we have a mini migration there of what we call the olive baboons. Very good, Cass enjoys seeing baboons, not as many, and this particular species of baboons, we call them the olive baboons. I have a big plan today, the area I am at the moment is the area we have always been seeing the sausage tree pride of lions. They love this area, I saw them yesterday, I saw two of the girls, one the king tail and the sister, and I do not know where they are today, and my main mission today is to look one of the sisters that have two small little cubs. This is one area they have been having a feast of wildebeest that they've been feeding on. And you can tell from those trees, it's a bit windy now. Feels very comfortable with temperatures of 22 degrees Celsius and 71 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not alone today out here, but all the way in South Africa, this one would like to say Hello to all of you. Indeed, indeed, David. It is us down here in South Africa that would like to say hello to all of you. And so, hello. My name is Tristan on camera. I've got Senzo this afternoon. And it is a very, very warm welcome to the South African side of this particular show. Remember that we do want to hear from all of you. So remember to ask lots and lots of questions so that we can have interesting and in-depth discussions this afternoon. Now, my plan for the day is to try and head off towards... Um, where Tandi, Klalamba, Hosana were kind of milling about. They were all not far from one another on Gari Katla and sort of Bufuzuk boundary. I'm, I'm pretty sure all three of them have moved, but it'll be just interesting to see what's going on there, try to see if we can pick up some tracks maybe and find out where exactly these guys have gone. If nothing happens there, then I want to head back towards roughly the area where I had that male lion, not because of him, but because at about 10 o'clock this morning, which is very, very late in the day, we had a male leopard which I gather is Tingana, sawing his lungs out very close to where we stay and between kind of where that male lion was and where we were. And so I'm hoping if I head in that direction, maybe towards Treehouse Dam, somewhere there, we might get lucky and find Tingana just lying up, resting after having a bit of a full belly from his impala kill that he had during the course of last night and the day before. So that's going to be roughly the plan. We're going to try and go an all-out spotted afternoon, which, as you know, is my favorite type of afternoon. The other good news is, unlike David in the Mara, we're not having any wind today, which is absolutely wonderful because this morning it was freezing cold and windy and and this afternoon it actually feels a lot more pleasant now it feels as though we kind of can deal with this kind of weather still overcast and gray and, and potential for rain um, so it's why we still have our roof on we're gonna keep that on just in case don't want to risk getting you know wet and, and disrupting any of our equipment and so still got the roofs which hopefully we can ditch at some point soon because getting pretty over them now after the last few days anyway while we kind of continue our search sydney seems to be on fire already this afternoon and has found what he was looking for a look at the king of the jungle every time when i hear the lion's roar i associate that with africa 
A very, very good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of the afternoon safari. I am Sydney Fumunani Mikosi and I am not traveling alone. This afternoon I am with Dave. We are going to try by all means and give you the best experience ever. For your questions and comments, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. You can also follow us on YouTube chat stream. Look at that. You can see that uh, this cat is enjoying the overcast as he's not worried about the sun at all. Look at the beautiful mane. So this is the mane these kind of cats are using in order to attract the mates. But apart from that, the very same mane helps them when they are fighting for their territorial challenges because it does protect their neck, which can be very vulnerable. So this is quite a very fluffy mane. I am so very much happy to see this. This is my first lion sighting here since I got back from my leave, which is something very special. And I'm sure this is one of the avoca males, the coalition, which is very popular in the area here in Juma. Look at how this lion, look at that now. Look at that. Amazing. So these kind of cats, they've got to yawn every time in order to cool the brain temperature. And when doing this is when they want to start moving around. Maybe he's so very much excited with the temperature at the moment. Look at that. Look at those big teeth. You can see that uh, the teeth are still very strong and sharp. So this kind of cats, they only battle when they start to break teeth because then it becomes very difficult for them to cut the mate. So you can see the ears are so very fluffy. <laughs> Uh, actually, the main color has got something to do with the age. If you look at this uh, cat at the moment, you can see that right at the bottom of the mane is starting to get very dark. But when they're still very young, you will see the mane as well is very small hairs. But now, this one, I can promise you, is one of the old males. If you can check the males together with the scratch marks on top of the nose, you can see that he has been around for quite a long time. He experienced a lot. So you can see those whiskers there on the side. So those are very sensitive hairs that these animals are using in order to measure the space in between the branches. So now he is sleeping again. Romet, I am going to give you a very interesting uh, story that I saw. At one stage some years ago, I heard one of the lions roaring. And it was shortly after the introduction of this lion. I used to work for South African National Parks. I was based at Marakele, which is just about 180 kilometers from Johannesburg. While I was there, on a guided walk in the morning, I could hear the lion roaring. And this lion was just about a few days old and it was one of the very big males. As this lion was roaring, the pride responsible of the territory started investigating. And this big male went with his females to check who was calling. When they got there, he saw that this big male roaring is so big and they can't stand for him. And he decided to run away and leave his females. And that is how that new male, the rival, uh, dominated the females. The responsible territorial holders saw that this one I cannot stand for and decided to run in front of us. It was very much interesting. <laughs> so they do show some respect, but some of them, they, they, they fight until they lose a battle. And that is when they become submissive. So now we are going to uh, David by the Masaimar, who's got one of the preferable animals when it comes to the lions, the buffaloes. Let's see how the buffaloes. Oh, it's like he had me saying the buffaloes. 
Very good, Sydney. Well done. And uh, we got some buffaloes here. And a huge herd of buffaloes. Got the African buffaloes. And they're just looking at us, wondering what is happening. But I think there's a bit more of a concern of the amount of wind that's blowing now. They've been grazing, but they just stopped as the wind is picking up. It's a young calf there. You can see the color is quite different from the fully grown female or cow there. It's getting irritated by a ox picker. You see it moving its head. That's not the concern of the wind, but I think those ox pickers are trying to get the parasite or the ticks right, maybe between the eyelashes, and that is quite a sensitive area. It's not nodding to say yes to me or to say no, but the position the ox picker is is not the best. But you'll always notice the ticks or mites tend to use the soft places where they can always stick themselves to get the blood from these animals. Hello there. Who do you think we are or who are you? So definitely she is getting attention from us and we you know she thinks we're either too big for her. Now as the wind have settled down a little bit, they continue grazing now. If they were well, a little smaller than that, I'm sure there's an ox pick is flying there. Sorry, Castebo Chris. Sometimes we have called them. Oh, Chris, yes, I, I, I think the buffalo, yes, could have been trying to talk to me. I agree with you. That's a great comment. Because she keeps moving her head up and down, up and down. Uh, it could be like Tor's trying definitely to communicate to me. And if you look at some of them carefully, let's see what they can get others. That on the faces, you can see like they have like white spots right below the eyes. If you see that... And those are the areas that you'll get the ox pickers concentrating on. And the process of getting the ticks out, I think, also they get the fur out. And buffaloes seem to have like double eyes right below the actual eyes. They are white spots below the eyes. And I'm sure that's what man is trying to get. Of all the animals in Africa, personally, the animal that I fear most is the buffalo. I've always thought I can survive many animals, but I have never wanted to take an advantage, I mean, take a chance with a buffalo. There's one ox picker on top of that on the left of the screen. We have two different types of ox pickers in Africa, either red bill ox picker or the yellow build. We have both in Kenya, quite a distance from where I am to know what ox picker they are, either red build or the yellow build. Hello. So if you look at those carefully, you see below the eyes, there are like two white patches. And my thinking is, the one on the right is much brown. If you look at it, it doesn't have the one that just went down to graze. It doesn't have that white, those white patches below the eyes, because that one is definitely young. But the two that are just looking at me, you can see the white patches, white patch below each eye. And those areas are always infested. With the ticks and when the ox pickers come i'm sure they pluck out the ticks plus a bit of uh, far and leaves those spots there permanently Kitas, buffaloes do not migrate and it depends on what you're talking about when you're talking migration they may do what i may call mini migration and mini migration will be a couple of kilometers or a couple of uh, miles just for food but when you talk of proper migration Kira, we are talking about the wildebeest the wildebeest do like almost 3,000 miles from say Serengeti National Park in Tanzania to the Mara Triangle in Kenya and that movement is always clockwise and it goes round 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 all the year that does not stop but these buffaloes here, I highly doubt they would go more than 300 miles from one point to another. So I would say buffaloes do not migrate. They'll always tend to remain together, which of course that gives them their strength by remaining together. 
and you can see the tall grass that we call the red oat grass and they definitely feed on it. They are bulk eaters but you can see that one is very tall what you see on your screen and is dry and they are not bothered to eat it. Christian, taking uh, the males out of the heart. Sorry, Cassie, just bring that question again. Ideally, when the males, buffaloes are very unusual, unlike most, well, you can see all the ox pickers flying up and then I'm sure they are having some good time getting the ticks out. Males, once they get a bit old, females will always show them the door. And of all the species of animals that they know in Africa, it is in general the buffaloes that have noticed the females forcefully you know, getting the males out of the herd and you get males forming their own clubs. Unlike other animals, for example, elephants, where once in a while the males will rejoin the herds for mating, once the buffaloes get very old and they're shown the door, they rarely come back. And when I was talking earlier that of all the animals in Africa, the one that they fear most are buffaloes, it's more the males than the females, because when these males are shown the door by the females, they get very grumpy. And if you come across on their way, because of them having bad moods and, you know, not very happy, they would easily attack you for no apparent reason. You're still enjoying looking at us, would you think? Or, you know, why, what can you see in us? I'm trying to imagine she's thinking we're either too big and not wondering where we are. Colleen, buffaloes are much bigger in size, that's number one, than the wildebeest. And these ones, we see they belong to the family that we call the bovinae, and the wildebeest are not. Wildebeest, you see them also traveling in big or huge herds. I'm talking, you could see a herd of about, say, 15, 20, 50,000 wildebeest together. And the buffaloes, maximum maybe a thousand, the largest herd I've seen of, you can see that herd, Colleen, by any standard, is a huge herd. But maybe the largest herd I've seen in the Maasai Mara is about a thousand together. But the wildebeest will be in like 20,000, moving in huge herds. And as I said earlier, they're always on the move. Buffaloes, you might get them in the same spot. For example, say three, four, five days, not going very far from that area. But the wildebeest, right now we have the migration of the wildebeest you know, in the Mara Triangle, we have almost all of them here, but by the end of the month, I'm sure, or early November, all of them will be gone back to Serengeti National Park in Tanzania, where they'll be preparing to bring down the babies in the month of February. Well, we got so many predators that come for buffaloes, and I think Sydney have a classical example of that. You can see that uh, this lion is very much pretty relaxed here. Nothing is happening at the moment. So, but I can see he is listening to what is happening in the surrounding. Because every time he is moving the ears, cleveling the ears and moving the head and the eyes. Maybe he has been here too long. He wants to go maybe for a drink or looking for something. Because the weather conditions at this stage, I can promise you, it does allow the cats to do something. Look at that. <laughs> He is now sleeping again. So, but uh, when looking at the bellies, they don't. It's not looking hungry. So yeah, if you can check the lions that are uh, residing in the area whereby there is cooler climates, they have got quite a lot of hairs from the mane, the elbows, and also on the stomach because this kind of hairs helps them in order to generate heat. But here by the elbows as well, to generate the heat as well as to help them when they are lying on the ground, because the front legs are one of the very most important tools, and they use them the most during hunting and when lying down as well. So think about the lion's hunting position. They've got to lay their legs on the ground, so the elbows must have to be well protected.
So look at that pole. That looks very much big. So by looking at that, you, you will never uh, think that this pole has got some of the claws hiding in there. And some of them, I'm not too sure if what I'm seeing there is a crack. But these kind of cracks here on the print, they help us in order to identify some of these animals. Just by looking at the track, you can easily tell this one is this. So those are the muzzles, this. So this animal is not angry at all. I can promise you all he's doing here is resting. He's enjoying because the cats, they, they spend much of the time sleeping. The lions have got a very nice record of spending approximately 18 to 20 hours just lying down. And after having a meal, they are going to spend a lot of time. When looking at the bellies on this lion, I can promise you the bellies are full. So I don't see any problems. He can still be here for quite a long time, but only when he's thirsty, he must go and quench the thirst by the nearest dam. And the nearest dam here is where he has been earlier this morning, which is the Vuyotela pan. When this lion is lying down like that, it's not forming any sign of a predator. <laughs> You can't even see where the head is. You can see it's very difficult to judge what it is unless you know that there is a lion here. So you can see that the color of the skin on top is different from the bottom. So now the colors at the bottom helps them in order to reflect the heat. But while I'm still waiting to see what is going to happen here, let's see what Tristan is up to. I'm sure Tristan is looking for the spotted cats at the moment. I am looking for spotty cats at the moment, Sydney, and so far not much luck. We found where Tandy and Tlalamba were this morning. Um, obviously, they're on the northern side, so can't really look too hard there. But it doesn't look like any signs of them coming back on our side at the moment. I did a kind of long section of the boundary, even a little bit further to the west than where they were, given that's the direction that they were heading most of the morning. Couldn't find really anything coming out, but it's not to say they didn't. There's been a lot of traffic up and down on the road, and the road is quite well driven and also very hard. And so it could have easily sort of crossed over and, and been able to have kind of gone into the, one of those drainage lines, maybe off towards Gallagher Pan. But at the moment, no sign of them that we can see. No sign of Hosanna either that I can find crossing north, which is a good thing. So what we did is we decided we'd head off towards Bufalzuk Dam and hope that we'd maybe find him there. In the meantime, though, we bumped into a nice little grouping of kudu that are on the fire break. They look very, very relaxed. They're all kind of feeding nice and slowly. They're not really too worried about anything. Not a leopard, you say? This looks like a camel. Well, I suppose a little bit. I think the kudu would be quite offended to be called a camel. They definitely do not have two humps on their back. They've only got that one kind of area, which is just big amounts of muscle that allows them to be able to jump very well and allows them to kind of evade predation to its, its large degree by, by being able to jump and so they do have that kind of fluffy patch behind the head and, and neck and that's just an area like I say of more muscle they've got huge muscles that kind of attach to those front legs that allow them to get, generate quite a bit of power so they're not like a camel in, in that regard they also uh, are very different in the rest of the structure and much smaller than a camel surprisingly enough they might look the same size but a camel is actually a much bigger animal than what these guys are but these guys I'm sure must be super happy that the rains have slowly but surely started to come because you know being a browsing animal as you can see there's so little browse in this area at the moment that it really makes it quite tricky to be able to actually find food and so they'll be happy that there is going to be some growth there you can see a beautiful young male is it a young male looks like a young male yes young male could do that is busy crossing over that's a very small young male within his first year that's kind of going into Bufalsuk. Rosalind, no. So female kudu don't have horns. What you would have seen there is a very small male that's got tiny horns, but this female on our right-hand side, I'm going to try to get a better view of her quickly. Let me just see if I can 
that this roof is a bit tricky because of the poles. So I do apologize about the pole that you'll see. But Rosin, if you look at this female, you'll notice on, oh, is that, have I parked badly here, since so hold on, let's move forward. It's always about trying to get the right angle for these poles as well as the camera and the animal itself. And you see now we're going to go behind a silly branch, hold on. Um, so Rosin, you'll see on this female she doesn't have horns at all. Um, so Kudu are one of those antelope species, like most of the antelopes, funny enough, that don't have uh, horns as females, but the males are the ones that do. Look how she's trying to get that new growth that's just coming out. You see there's a few new green leaves. She, she's stretching as far as she can just to be able to get those and eat them. And you can see as they grow how quickly they get uh, chomped up by these guys, kudus and impalas and nyalas and bushbuck. They will be having a field day with all the new little growth. And as soon as we get a bit of sun, it's still too cold for really anything to go happen with these trees. But as soon as there's a little bit of sun, then you're going to see that they're going to come out and you'll find these guys will be very happy. Shame girl, is the other one too tall for you? Looks like it. It looks like she's a little bit kind of too short to reach those ones just on top so now she'll kind of move off and try and find another tree with green leaves and she can kind of start feeding on and get a bit more nutrients but the rest of your herd's the other way girl Noella, you say you're really looking forward to the summer for these animals. Yes, it will be good for them. It's hopefully going to be a wet summer, which means that there will be a lot more growth than there has been over the past couple of years. Um, obviously, like I always say, it makes it difficult for us, but for the animals themselves, it's always good when they get nice wet years. They get a lot of uh, water, and, and that therefore a lot of kind of growth comes out, and the animals then get into much better condition. But remember that in wet seasons, the predators suffer a little bit. Their numbers typically... Um, start to drop off uh, you will find that they have very successful years when it's a little bit drier and the, the predator numbers increase and then when it gets a lot wetter you often find the predator numbers start to go down a little bit and that's just because they have less success with cubs um, they tend to you know lose cubs to all kinds of things as well as then not be able to provide as uh, decent amount of nutrition um, and so you find that the, the kind of predator numbers always will take a little bit of a downturn um, as the sort of wet seasons start to take hold heavily if you start to get those wet kind of cycles then you'll see it so it's almost quite a, a lag effect that you've got so as it kind of goes wet seasons so you get this wet kind of cycle and the antelope numbers will increase with those wet cycles um, and then as that turns to the dry cycle so that then the predators start to catch up as the you know the the antelope species start to drop off due to the dryness and the droughts um, cycles and then it kind of lags behind one another so it's kind of rain in front um, or dry period and then antelopes and then the predators at the back that respond to it it's quite an interesting kind of graph to watch as it goes along Anyway, we're going to carry on. Our kudu's kind of hiding itself away there, so we're going to head back towards Spifflesook Dam area, see if we can get lucky. I mean, I sh theoretically should have luck at any stage during the course of the afternoon because of how grey and kind of overcast it is. It's not hot, so the cats, I don't think, are going to be too sleepy. So we should be able to find them if they're on the move, and hopefully they will and cause a bit of an alarm call. Now, while I head off towards Spifflesook Dam and go try and kind of figure out if there's any sign of Hosanna or any of our other cats that send you, I think, back across to Sydney, who's still sitting with his evoker male. I am still here with one of the avocas, uh, the sleepy lion. You can see there he's got very huge muzzles. You know, these kind of cats, they are very much protective. When they've got a family or a pride, they are responsible uh, to protect the key, the small ones, they are also responsible in order to protect the females. And these animals, they can do whatever it takes in order to protect their prize. They can even put their life on a line. When it comes to the family, they don't want to hear anything. So you can see that those mothers are very well equipped. Together with those teeth that we saw earlier when he was yawning, yawning, uh, he can be very dangerous against any of the intruders in the area. So the fight amongst these male lions can be very much vicious. Some can badly, uh, they can, can badly get injured. So you can see that the
Uh, Rowan, the lions, uh, in terms of the size, they look much smaller. The tigers, they look very much big. And between the two, we will see tigers are very much fat. So the lions, yes, they can be very fat, but not as much as the tigers. And the tigers are much more aggressive. I think lions are less aggressive compared to the tigers, which is something very much good. Yes, here in the bush, the lions are considered the king of the jungle. Specifically, the males are associated with that. So these kind of males, when they are walking by themselves, they have got to do their own, they must have to do their own hunting. So the lions are very much territorial and they can cover quite a very big land. So their territories can go up to four and a half to five and a half kilometers square. And that is very big. But their territories is determined by a lot of uh, territorial activities. So if there is quite a lot of competition in the area, their territories are going to become very much small. But if there is no challenges, is when they are going to extend it and make it much bigger. But remember, once a territory is marked, it's marked. It has to be defended. So if they want to overlap the territories, is when there will be quite a lot of uh, fightings with the other males from the neighboring territories. So a territory is an area which is not specifically for uh, food availabilities. It's an area which is there demarcated for mating and breeding. So that is why these kind of animals, such as the lions, they can stay together with the other animals because they cannot interbreed with them. Only if these animals can interbreed is when you will see a very big problem. Polar. So the lions, they are spending much of their day sleeping because of the following reasons. One, these animals, they eat quite a lot of food. And because of doing that, their digestive system needs quite a lot of time in order to break down this small piece of meat into small particles so that they can survive. So these kind of animals, after they kill, they are just going to lie down and drink water in order to allow the digestive system to take place. They are going to sleep here for quite a lot of hours, 19 hours, 18 to 19 hours approximately. That is quite a lot. And at night they travel long distances as well, uh, trying to patrol their territories. So I like it a lot when hearing the lions roaring. So their roars, they are so very much interesting, fascinating. From a very long distance, you just hear that very big noise, that very big sound. So I could hear this one roaring this morning while I was out on a guided walk. It was as if it was very close. So now let's go back to the Masai Mara and see how my other colleague David is doing. I'm sure he's got something very, very interesting for you at the moment. Well, the avocas reminds me of a coalition of lions here that we call the Musketeers. And also the difference between these two coalitions is the musketeers, I think, are bigger in size and they have big manes, you know. And when you look on their paws, especially when they are laying down their paws up, their paws are much huge. And I noticed because I watched the avocas a lot and I followed them while out on some game drives in Juma. The avocas in general would go and steal the kill from the Nukuhumas. When the pride, Nukuhumas pride would go have a kill, the avocas were so used to going and snatching the kill from them. 
but the musketeers here in the Mara Triangle, more often than not, they tend to hunt their own food and apparently they will not share with the females around this area. So that's one difference I would say between the Avul Camels that are in Sydney and the musketeers around here. Manu, I can see an early from a distant thing. It's a young bull. Tell me what could be the best angle. Do you want me to keep going? All right. We've got an early coming up. I think there's a young bull on his own. That's good. Manu, I think that could be a good position for him to show us this. Just get a young bull on his own there. I don't know whether he could have been thrown out of the herd. And yes, that's very nice to see a bull in wonderful light. Not sure he's eating or he's trying to tell us what's up, what you want close to me. We are quite a while, about uh, 100 meters away from where he is. The wind is still holding and blowing. And my guess is he could be a slightly bit too young to be on his own. You can see the amount of wind from the grass stalks there, how they're being blown. Young boy, you should keep eating to grow and get big. Maybe be able to go join the other males and once in the bulls group, they don't push you around. You should go there when you're strong. But I think as yet, he's still a young boy. Not sure what to do at the moment. And if maybe he was just recently thrown out of the herd, he got a lot of calculations to make which group of boys to join, or fast to spend a few days or weeks on his own. Very majestic walk there. Not sure he looks very healthy, especially if we look on the back legs and the backbone seems to be bulging out, which is not very characteristic of elephants. They got lots of food to eat here in the Mara. Don't hide from us, keep walking. Very good. We had some big showers yesterday and early today and I expected his task to be looking white and clean, but most likely he could have been digging a lot of mud and that's why they don't look sparkling clean. Do 24, I guess anything when they're 12 years uh, is an age when they're always shown the door by the matriarch, want to cross the road there. So anything when they're 12, they're shown the door and they're told to go maybe get a wife, get a job and start living on your own. And I highly doubt he could be 12. Maybe he could be 10 or that age around. So what we want to do is just move forward a little bit and see whether they can get close to see how he is putting his ears out. Let's just move forward a little bit and see whether they can see him as he crossed the road and find out what reason would have made him cross the road. Because to me, the left side and the right side of the road looks the same. And I don't see him going to join anybody else. Let's see if you're gonna stop on that bush and maybe eat. No, he keeps walking. And look at the beautiful savannah there in the background. All oh, that open space. That is one characteristic or one habitat of the Mara Triangle. Trunk up, I'm sure it's just to smell us. We're not following you. He has to be sure. They're very good picking up scent. Ellie's using their trunks and maybe get some now confidence to slow down and grab some small little plants from the ground there to feed on. Keeps walking. Sometimes they just pick something, use their feet to knock the soil out and then straight to the mouth. And the wind continues hauling. The temperatures are down now. If you notice, it's very characteristic of elephants to keep flapping their ears to cool off but he is not, meaning maybe the temperatures could have gone below maybe 20 or below 70 Fahrenheit, below 20 degrees. Yeah, a little bit flat there on the left ear. If it could have been midday with the heat of the day, 
the beep flapping a lot but I'm sure now he's trying to pick any sound from a distance but nothing to flap the ears in terms of cooling off whatever plants he got there elephants will both uh, graze and browse to just pick the plant and get it to the mouth I would guess he would be looking for a heart that he could fit in but if the matriarch just threw him out the other day before he set us down maybe from the trauma if he has been growing with the rest you know the mothers the aunties the cousins together or sisters and for the first time he has been shown the door to me I would think that's a bit of a trauma and he may take a few days to recover from that trauma and to know or to get his place so for the next few days I don't know for how long he might just be wandering in this huge Masimara triangle before he can get a home or before he can either rejoin I doubt he would rejoin the hut he was thrown out from but chances are he would join the other boys watch out don't try to strain your legs they got very huge feet and very huge circumference at least so they have very good balance you might wonder when they go in holes or walk over some very big boulders they might hunt themselves but in general they'll always have very good balance as they walk on their four legs I have always known Tristan to be very good when it comes to leopards. I do not know where his luck is, but I'm sure he is working hard to get one. Well, yes, David, we're trying our very, very best. At this stage, though, we're getting a bit of a hiding from our leopards. They are not anywhere to be found, can't find any tracks. I mean, the conditions are not ideal to be finding leopards, to be honest. Their tr the little paws are perfectly designed to hide out and to not have any tracks register on hard substrate like this at the moment. It's going to take a day or two until it's easier to see what's going on. Also, the light is really not helping us. So, you know, much more kind of sunlight would be better to give us a bit more shadow at the moment it's kind of just a flat surface and it's very tricky to see what's going on in fact I keep stopping and trying to kind of look and just randomly check and see what's going on but so far I haven't had much luck at all so I thought Hosanna might be at Biffles Dam he hasn't come through there yet but did it run away now it did there was a diker that was there and that has run away so cull six no dung beetles out in the bush it did have one in camp a few nights ago that was buzzing about and actually did, who did it fly into it flew into someone's head i can't even remember actually now was it, was it jamie or jerry maybe one of the two of them um it flew into their head and clung to their hair which is what dung beetles often do at night um but no not many in the bush yet so it, it hasn't rained enough just yet i mean you know even though it looked like it rained a lot the last two days and it was miserable it really wasn't much in total i think we got about five millimeters of rain which is you know, it's really not very much at all the bush is so dry that that would have been sucked up in about two seconds by most of the trees out here doubt the grass really got much out of it and that's why we haven't seen kind of any pushing through of new blades of grass yet as soon as we get a proper rainstorm and a bit of sun then we'll start to kind of see it but the amount of rain that we got really wasn't sufficient to actually get anything really kind of kick-started just yet it's still not enough um, it'll help and it certainly will start the process but it's not enough to turn that massive change that we sometimes see when it goes from dry like this and then into this bright kind of green lush vegetation that's not going to happen just yet i don't think we're going to need a lot more rain than that and hopefully it will come soon and we will see it but and that's when you'll start to see the dung beetles actually coming out the ground itself is probably still very dry and very hard and those larvae and various other creatures that do come out when rain happens probably find the soils a little bit tough for them at the moment and it hasn't quite reached where they are and therefore hasn't kind of kick-started them to come up and start seeking you know food and various other things and opportunities to mate and so I would imagine that it still be a few kind of days until we actually start to see that now the good thing about being in this area 
is that it is there are antelope all over the place so there's lots of kudu and impalas that have been spread all through this section so hopefully if one of these animals moves we should get an alarm call that should take place and hopefully we'll then be able to pick it up the problem is is we want to obviously hear it over the car which means it's got to be fairly kind of close but you never know maybe we'll get lucky and, and one of them will walk out i'm pretty sure hosana is around it's just a matter of scratching out which way he went did he come towards buffalo's hook Ah, there's an owl. I don't know if we're going to get it with our roof on, but in this tree above us, just go up sends a little bit higher. Okay, now straight in towards the sort of angled bar, so like up in the top there. Go, 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 go. There it is. I can just see it up to the right a little bit for me, sends. Straight in more. Uh, up to the right a little bit more. Other way, other way. There, there. Now straight in. Up. Straight. Where are you now? It's definitely there. I saw it now. Um, ew, the camouflage on this tree is very tricky. Um, it should be there somewhere, Sense. In that center frame behind the branches. Can you go in a little bit further for me? A little bit more and up a bit. Is that not it there? Oof, it's difficult to see it now. I've lost it. I saw it kind of fluffle its feathers and land there, but I've now I can't see it very well. Let me just roll back for you a bit, Sens. Um, all right, now we should be able to see it. It's a bit more silhouetted against the sky now, um, for me at least. But um, okay, go out a bit. All right, now start on this right-hand branch. I'm going to try get start there, then follow that, and then come up there. So that's roughly where we're looking. No, sorry, Chris. What did you say with painted wolf? Where are you now? Are you in there? A log owl, painted wolf. No, and unfortunately, log owls don't fly unless there is Harry Potter around and magicking this thing around. There we go. Listen. So it's calling, it's right there. Since if we come, you're in the right place, but why can't I see it on the frame? Go up a little bit for me. I mean, I can see it with my naked eye, but I just can't pick it up on the camera itself. Come out a little bit for me, Ben. And let's see now. Okay, now I've got to work this out again. So it's definitely the right branch. Okay, oh no, wait, you need to go higher. It's this branch here. You go higher, sense. <laughs> Can you go higher or not with the roof? Oh, there, this branch. Now come along, come along. No, to the left now. Up. There it is, straight in the middle now. You can see it. There we go. Oh, go. Now, there we've got it. Phew, that was tricky. But how's that camouflage? Isn't that incredible? So there's our pearl-spotted owlet sitting in the tree. I can at least think I'm not crazy now because I'm, I was 99% sure we'd find it there. It was just on the wrong branch altogether. It's not an easy tree to kind of tell somebody where to go. Lots and lots of branches going in all different directions. And a bird that's that color against this white sky and kind of drab light is very tricky but you can see those black spots on the back of the head very indicative of pearl spotted olives it's those little fake eyes that they've got at the back and it almost looks like you they're watching us and obviously they have that for a reason it's to deter predation from behind they can kind of move around and everybody kind of thinks that they're watching them and there they go flies off but that was cool Sorry it took a while for us to actually spot it and it's now actually a little bit more out in the open on the back tree but So let's see. <laughs> yes, it wasn't. It wasn't very good, was it? It wasn't a shining example of how quickly to find a bird. But at least we managed to see it. It's actually right out in the open now. So I'm going to try and see if we can get a better view of it, and we can just kind of stop fairly close by. I'm hoping it's not going to fly away. If we uh, no, it's flying already. So no, that's not going to work. Okay, well we tried though, but at least we got to see it. Not. It just goes to show how tricky they are to f actually spot in the daylight when they are quiet and really not easy to actually see. Anyway, somebody who's not struggled to find something this afternoon and not struggled with his eyesight is Sydney, and he's still with the Avoca Mail. I am still here with the Avoca. You can see the Avoca is still 
having a very nice sleep. You know, these kind of uh, animals, a lot of people, they think, you no, know, only the females are responsible for hunting activities. The males, as they are getting older, when they are starting to reach maturity, they get kicked off from their pride and form their own coalition. And that is when they must have to look for the food for themselves. Yes, they do scavenge sometimes, but they must have to also do some little bit of hunting. And what I like about the female lions the most is that they do give credit to the responsible males in the prides because they are responsible to protect them. When they go for hunting, they omit them from hunting activities and they only call them to come and eat when the food is ready. Is that not amazing? That is interesting. <laughs> Early, uh, the birds, they do give alarm calls for these different kinds of uh, predators. First thing you must remember is that some of the birds, they are ground dwellers. They nest on the ground and they give alarm calls on anything that is coming towards the nest. Yes, some they give calls because they know these predators, sometimes they do predate them. So predators also attack some of the birds. So they give this kind of alarm calls. And we do follow these alarm calls, but sometimes you will get surprised because birds, they are not only worried about the presence of big predators such as cats, they also complain about the other birds, the species that predate other birds. So that is why every time we hear a warning call, we have to investigate. Sometimes you find that they are against an owl, so the birds can also complain against each other. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to leave this avoca uh, male here and go up to the nearest waterhole and see if we can find something. As earlier on, there has been a so heard in this area. We might be lucky maybe with one of the spotted cat. And then shortly after that, I'll come back. I have got to come back very quickly because of the following. The rain washed away the soft, fine particles of soil. It's difficult this afternoon to conduct trekking. If I lose him here, it will be very much difficult for me to reallocate him. So I will just go around and check what's happening in the area and come back again. So let's see if we can find uh, something interesting in this area. So it is very, very quiet at the moment. So now uh, let's go back to Tristan and hear how he is doing. Well, Sydney, if you think it's quiet for you, then you obviously have not been on this car because it is deathly quiet in this area at the moment. Now, the only thing I've got is tracks for our male lion from last night where he walked down this way. No sign of Hosanna, no sign of Tanya and um, no sign of Tingana, and well, no sign of very much else, to be honest. So we're just kind of slowly cruising along the edge of this Gauri cut line drainage. I believe this is where Brent left Hosanna this morning and so I'm just checking if he's not still hanging about here somewhere in these conditions though you know how he can be he's a very mobile cat and could be all over the place at the moment wouldn't be surprised if he was hunting this morning and actually trying to kind of find food at some point he also might have gone towards Tandy and Clalo particularly if Tandy was contact calling he might have headed northwards into Buffalshook and with all the cars going up and down we've missed the track but the only thing we can do is just to drive around. Unfortunately, also, it's just kind of myself and Sydney. There seems to be nobody else out on drive, which is going to make it a little tricky as well because not as many eyes and ears that are around. You know, often we'll find things because somebody will hear something or, you know, they'll bump into an animal on a road when you're on a different road, kind of even looking for the same animal. So always a, a lot harder when it's just the kind of two of us out here and hopefully we'll be able to find something. There is a nice 
track of Ellie's coming down here, so we'll try and scratch around for these guys. In the meantime, though, let's send you back across to David up in the Mara, who well, has had a lot more luck than I have this afternoon and seen many, many things. And he's now got one of our iconic cats walking down the road. Well, Tristan, I'm sure before the end of the drive, you'll come up with something exciting. But now, my hard work for looking for the sausage tree pride has borne fruits because I've got one of the females of the sausage tree pride. My gut tells me she is walking in a mood of wanting to go for a hunt because if you look on the left, see that huge fig tree there, there are loads of wildebeest. And the direction they are walking, and if you look at the direction she is walking, this might be the end of the game. She is walking straight that way, and the wildebeest are walking on the other way. She is alone at the moment, but I'm not surprised. Lions single-handedly have been known to hunt. So what I want to do now, we'll just drive forward and see what might transpire maybe in the next two minutes. But something tells me she may be going for a hunt. One of those beasts there will go down. So let's just move forward a little bit and find out what might happen now. So the will be still going this way and you see what happens to the be when they walk, they walk on a single file. Ruslin lions smell very well. For me I think the sight and smell come out to be about 50-50 but I tend to think they see maybe a little bit better than the smell. Unlike the hyenas, I would say the sight is much stronger than smell. So I'll still keep driving forward and find out where she has gone. But you can tell she's walking on a purpose and definitely she wants to hunt. And we might be preparing ourselves. Let me just first stop right here and see what she's going to do. And there she's just stalking and she's moving the grass there. Look at her, look at her pace now. That's definitely a hunting mode. And the wildebeest are going on the other direction. And look at the wildebeest where they are. We could exciting action. Yes, please. I mean, this could be exciting. Why not casting? She's moving slowly, at purpose now, not sure she has started too early, oh no, oh she's, Hello everybody and welcome to the Maasai Mara Triangle and we got a huge herd of wildebeest running away from what would have been a hunt and there's a lioness right there and she's laying down and think what she's doing she's laying an ambush that was the first batch of the wildebeest that ran in one direction and then there was another herd to the left but I think both groups or both herds have sensed or smelled this particular lioness and they have taken off. I think she did not calculate very well and for that reason most likely they might have spotted her. For those who have never joined us before, this particular lioness belongs to a pride of lions that we call the sausage tree pride that consists of four females and one of the females have cubs. She is on her own at the moment and I'm sure if she would have been successful she would have invited the other lioness especially the one with the cub to come and join the party now the will be going in the different or in the opposite direction where they came from but that tells me they might not have seen the lioness where she was because the wind was going towards them they might have smelled her but not seen her And the way they are running, it tells me definitely they do not know where she is. And she's closing in. She's moving a little closer. Not sure at what point she might pause or she might have like, well, have I been spotted? And if she thinks that, then she may like, well, game over and maybe I may not go for them. But let's just find out, wait and see what happens. 
She just went in the grass there. And you can see the confusion on the wildebeest. There is lion, yes, go, lioness, go, go. And remember, should you have any questions or comments to make, you're more than welcome to do that on hashtag Safari Live. It's a huge fig tree there. And now this is another group of wildebeest on the other side of the fig tree and all going in a single file, some running, some just walking. More often than not, because of the wind that is there, they would get very confused. So they're going in different directions. One group going this way and the other group going the other way. So what we want to do is just to move forward and look closer and see if this lioness might make a plan. So let's just drive another 30 seconds and see where she is and what she exactly wants to do. Because it could be very epic to see her going for a hunt and bringing down a wildebeest. Single-handedly, as I said earlier, they have been known to just go like that. Like this, as I said earlier, is part of the sausage trip ride. This one doesn't have any cubs with her and not sure whether she is pregnant or not. But either way, if she decides to go for a hunt, it's very easy to give the chase. But I think she might have started very early and uh, most likely it's for the game for herself. So she may be going for plan B and maybe much later in the day. Because where she is now, I do not see any will be anywhere close to her. Fantastic how epic that would have been if she would have gone for a hunt. But to all of you, very many thanks for having, you know, been with us watching. Don't stay very far. We might give you other notifications and if another action happens, we'll be with you. But in the meantime, we'll be as usual on our YouTube and keep following and watching the show. Excellent. Good luck to this lioness. In the meantime, we're going to go look and find out where the one with the cab could be. Having seen this one, it's very easy now maybe to locate the other ones. But in the meantime, let's find out what Sydney is up to in South Africa. I have got a lovely kudu sighting here. A group of kudus together is called a focal of kudus. So you can see now they are trying to have something to eat. They are concentrating on these fresh leaves that are starting to come back now by some of these trees. It was a very lovely sighting until the small decker scared these kudus and they decided to go away. Look at that. There's also a young male. It's quite a very big female here. It's quite a very a big uh, family. So if you look at the hairs, today there's a disappearance when it comes to the stripes because they raise the hairs. They look very fluffy in order to protect themselves against the cold. So the big ears are moving all the time in order to hear what is happening in the surrounding. So these kind of animals, the kudus, if you can check, they have got a very big mane here at the back. And when that mane is flat, it means they are not in a good condition. That is when they must have to go around this field and look the bones. They even go for the bones and eat the bones of the other old dead animals, chew them in order to get calcium. So calcium helps them a lot as well. So now I'm going to carry on towards the tree house dam to see if we can find something going there for a drink this afternoon. Maybe this kudus has been there. Let's go and find out. So there is quite a lot of impalas here. So you can see that the predators are much more towards where we come from uh, because there's quite a lot of prey animals different species here where i am at the moment so i have seen the kudus i can see the impalas there but where we, we are coming from where we saw the lions is very very quiet there so the prey species they know about the presence of those predators there
So now let's go back to uh, David who's got the lioness, the hungry lioness, let me rather say that, who is looking for something to eat this afternoon. Well, this lioness have not given up because she is on the move again and she had an advantage of being on the deep. And the wildebeest are up on the horizon and she is walking towards them. And we're going to be seeing her. I'm not sure she got a bit of a limp. And that could be a drawback when, if she need to do a chase. I'm going to stop here for us just to watch her walking style. But it tells me she got a little bit of a limp. Not sure. Manu, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, that's not a good walking style for a hunter. If you really are going to chase a wildebeest, that sometimes they're very fast. You must be in very good physical shape. But that doesn't mean she may not go for the wildebeest. But you can tell she is a bit limpy now. What we're going to do, we're going to move forward and find out what her plants could be. Okay, Mila, move. But this lioness is also will defend their territories and not only the males, not only the coalition of males that tend to defend the territories. So even lionesses will do that. And we have seen them fighting with other prides of lions. So, for example, in the Mara, we have what we call the Owino pride of lions. We have the Olololos, we have the Paris pride. And if they have a kill, we have seen them fighting over the kills and if one pride would venture in the territory of another we have seen them going for each other and just clawing each other and also teething each other so those are the will be some talking about out there on the horizon and as much as she is not walking in very good shape i think she knows if she gets pretty pretty close she may go for them but now from the wind the direction the wind is blowing is blowing towards the wildebeest and she's on the left but them walking on the other way I highly doubt they might be able to pick her so she's looking in a different direction now Leonis go 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 when you see her walking through the grass which is quite uneven unlike the road you don't easily tell she is limping a little bit she seems to be walking fine but on a flat surface on the front service rather you can tell either the front pool or the back like I don't know which one has a problem but yeah from what you can see there that's not very good walking still I doubt when it comes to running how she's going to handle that but she's still behind those will be and you're gonna also go try close and find out if she might be lucky I think she is, she is blending in very well in the, you know, the red oat grass and now walking right in the middle of the road and the wildebeest have gone further right but I think she is not letting go once she knows she is in the right place because what the wildebeest will do at one point they are going to stop and start grazing and that I think is the time now she will have a proper plan and attack. Minamu, always good to hear your name, but I will tell you what we have done or what we have known here, especially in the Mara. If, unfortunately, they fracture their legs or any other part of the body, we have always left them to fix themselves. And most of them will always recover very quickly. If it has not involved man in terms of like, you know, a careless driver or people in the local villages or neighboring, the game reserve and they went spearing or hurting the animal because it came so close to their village we have always left mother nature to take care of their, the you know of the lions and normally minamu they recover very quickly so that's the heart of the wildebeest that she is thinking of and as they said earlier at one point they gonna stop and they'll start grazing us and to get stuck and once they do that she knows she'll very slowly get close to them and maybe chance on getting one of them down the migration have brought a big feast to all the cats in the Mara be they lions cheetahs or leopards and as long as the wildebeest 
remains or the migration remains here, the party will continue. It's until the wild between the zebras are gone, then we'll start thinking of bigger prey like buffaloes or giraffes or elands. But in the meantime, every few days we have seen them going down, going and bringing down our wild beast. You can see the panting on it. It's just because of that small walk she has had and maybe that's why she had decided to have a bit of a rest before making another plan. Now she's looking in the direction the other wildebeest came from to see if there could be any. I don't see any from where she's looking at. And I'm sure she'll have some good rest, recover, re-energize herself and maybe make another go to those wildebeest. Let's find out whether Tristan is winning on his leopards or anything else. No, not at all, David, is the answer to that. I, we are not winning. Uh, there is a zero sign that we can find. But, you know, it's now the time of the day, hopefully, that Hassan will be starting to walk around. And so what we're going to plan to do is, because there's a lot of these guys, which are in front of us at the moment, um, around this afternoon, we're going to go head off towards Buffalzook Dam. And we're just going to go sit there and be quiet for a good sort of 10 minutes and just go and listen and try and figure out maybe if something is around. You never know. He m there might be an alarm call or something. Thing, or he might even show up. It's always a good bet just to go set up a Fussock Dam when he's been moving in that general direction. He tends to wander past there. And so if you can time it right, then sometimes you can kind of get good sightings of him milling about in that area. So that's what we're going to go try to do. In the meantime, though, we'll just kind of watch these impalas for a little bit. Been lots and lots and lots of these guys out and about today. They've been all over the place, actually. Everywhere I've driven, I've seen them. And you can see there's a really nice big bachelor herd that we've got lots and lots of males some really quite impressive guys in this particular grouping as well with some nice sets of horns on them um, and they you know the summer of the year shouldn't really be too many bachelor herds around should be far more mixed herds given that most of the females are, are pregnant but every now and then you will see the kind of males grouping up together and, and forming these little bachelor groupings you might find that there's a herd of females not too far away that they're just kind of trailing behind but it's always nice to kind of stop and watch these guys. They are so underrated in many respects, and everyone kind of looks over them. So always nice to just spend time. So Paula, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it gets thicker. I mean, de you definitely see them puffed out a lot more. So they definitely will sit with their coats kind of, um, or the hair on their coats pushed out so that they can catch more air. Um, but whether it gets thicker, I'm not quite sure, actually. I'd, it's a good question as to whether or not it does. Um, I would imagine there must be some thickening of that coat, especially, you know, the winter gets cold. It, it, a lot of people laugh about temperature here. And funny enough, we had some viewers that visited the other day, and they were saying to us that they always laugh about it because they've grown up in, in you know, the Netherlands and Germany and Europe and and also spent some time in, in colder parts of the States. And they were saying that they always used to laugh at us when we used to talk about it being cold here. And then they came and they realized just how cold it can be when you're in an open viewer and, and out and exposed. Now, why have these guys all popped their heads up? Oh, no, everybody's okay. For a second there, I thought maybe they had heard something we hadn't. Often you'll find if there's another alarm call somewhere that everybody bolts their heads up like that. But it seems as though whatever it was is nothing to stress about because... They've all kind of stopped and started to feed again. I can actually see the females, they're way down the road at the moment. So they're just off the back of this kind of end. Anyway, right, we're gonna move on. We're gonna head towards Buffalzook Dam for our quiet plan. And while we do that, let's send you back across to Sydney, who's found something that Hosanna loves to chase around. Oh, look at that, I've got a very nice group of guinea fowls. A group of guinea fowl is called a confusion of the guinea fowls. They just confuse when they are running around. So this kind of uh, birds can be very much interesting. And there is a very interesting traditional belief on them. You know, we believe that when eating the guinea fowl, you don't have to eat the head. If you eat the head, you are going to become nomadic. You are just going to keep moving, reallocating, uh, every time so for the rest of your life you'll be staying here for three months and you'll build another house somewhere and you move you'll be moving in between the villages all the time so look at that this is quite a very beautiful bed and these beds is one of those beds who also carry quite a lot of uh, 
uh, tapeworms. You don't just eat the guinea fowls all year round. They are specific times where you can eat them and some of the times we are discouraged to do so. You can eat the guinea fowls by the month without letter R. So by the month with letter R you must avoid them. In other words you can only eat them by the May, June, July and August month because when September comes it has got letter R. All the way down to March there is letter R. So these are part of the ground dwellers. So these birds, they nest on the ground, but for the safety, they also fly up and hide by the trees. So if you see their little ones, when they come out of the shell, already you will see them walking around and they can call, they can run. So because they are vulnerable, they must have to come out well equipped. So they are precocial. Everything is happening before they come out of the shell. So we are just going to carry on now and see if we can find something before we got back to the avoca male. <laughs> Paula, the guinea fowls, they taste very nice. The problem is one, the guinea fowl takes time in order to um, in, in order to cook them. So if you want to cook them, it's going to consume quite a lot of food. And if it's electricity, they will consume quite a lot of electricity. It's a very hard body and also when it's well done still the bones are very much strong. <laughs> So I'm just going to check if we can find something interesting and then go back to one of the avoca males, the lion that we have just left earlier. Maybe we will be lucky much more down this side. Uh, Shimama, the guinea fowls babies, they don't have blue heads. And you must check, the blue heads ones are those that are, um, uh, are old. So as they are growing is when it's changing and when they are old is when you will see them with the blue heads. So it takes time before they get the blue head. So by the guinea fowls, the small ones are very much fast. <laughs> so they can run very quickly. And they can easily get camouflaged. So guinea fowls has got quite a lot of different calls. Sometimes when the guinea fowls are calling, we'll never I think that is the guinea fowl. I did pick up a very strong smell here in the area. So now, uh, while I'm heading back to uh, the Avoca, let's go to David by the Masai Mara and see how his lioness is doing. Maybe the lioness is showing some activities now. So what I've done now is to try and expand my search for the one with the cubs. But in the meantime, uh, when the migration comes, yeah, what happens, we always see also lots of death. And this, not the best smell I'm getting, is what is left as the migration starts moving or when the migration comes here, yeah, we see also lots of death that's left behind. And this is what used to be a wildebeest, of course not anymore. And because there are so many of skeletons like this around in the Mara, the hyenas have not been bothered to come for it. That could be the femur of that poor wildebeest. And once, you know, all the beasts are gone, or no, the zebras are gone, and the hyenas will 
miss, you know, getting fresh food is when they'll come for this old skeleton that I left behind. But I think Sinari got a feathered friend. I do indeed. We've got a beautiful view of an African hawk eagle that seems very interested in something down on the ground. It keeps kind of looking down and bobbing its head all over the place. It is seriously, seriously kind of interested in something. And it's hopped from one branch to another, kind of to get lower to the ground. You see, look how it's bobbing its head, looking around. I wonder if there's not a kill here somewhere that we maybe disturbed it on its way when we arrived. I mean, it was sitting already when I got here, but it looks like it's going to fly there. You see, it's going down onto the ground. What is it that it's looking for? I'm going to try to go forward a little bit for us so we can still see it. It's definitely kind of looking at something. So we're going to just try and see what's down here. And these guys are big bird hunters. So they'll go after things like guinea fowl and Franklin. And maybe it's spotted something along those lines. And that's what it's going after. Or it's already killed and might want to go and feed off. But let's just see. I'm just going to try and turn the car around this corner. Hopefully it's not going to fly away. Because I can see it there. And I just want to try and get into a nice position that if it goes onto the ground, that we can see it. Let's go forward a bit, Sense. Cal 6? Um, no, I don't. No, I. No, I mean, cannibalism s applies to basically eating yourself or not yourself but your uh, one of your kind so even though it is a bird it's not considered cannibalism because it's not eating one of its actual species so i think that's probably where cannibalism's definition comes from is eating one's own species um, and so even though birds are related and it hunts other birds i don't think it can be referred to as cannibalism uh, i mean you know it's the same as lions killing a leopard you know you wouldn't call it a cannibalistic act if they eat another one of their own another lion then yes yeah, sure but as a kind of just another cat no now i wonder where it's going it's still looking around all over the place here it's just flying a little bit further now it's going up to another branch. Let's just go forward and keep following it around. I wonder if there's something here. You might find, of course, it could be a little baby scrub hair or maybe some chicks of some sort that are on the ground that it was looking at. Or maybe it just spotted something and it wasn't quite so sure what it actually was. But it's intriguing behavior because, it's, you know, normally these guys will fly about all over the place. But this particular one is being very nice to us and is allowing us to get quite close. And is kind of hopping about from tree to tree to tree. Now, hopefully, it's going to let me just get round here for Senzo. Just good there, Senz. A little bit. There we go. Oh, that's beautiful. They really are a beautiful raptor with that streaky kind of chest and that bright yellow eye. Now this is one of the pair that we have the nest not too far away. Um, and you kind of see them around here quite regularly. And I think they've gotten quite used to us over the past few months. You can see it's still watching though. Look how it's bobbing its head. And that bobbing of the head is quite common in raptors. It's when they're trying to judge depth and trying to just analyze something and check things out that they do this. You see, look how it's doing it. What have you seen? Hawk Eagle. So Project Alpha, you say, second favorite bird of prey. They are amazing. I, the guy that I trained under, actually, when I first became a guide, it was his favorite um, bird of prey. And they are incredibly beautiful birds. And, and, you know, obviously, incredible technique that they show when they hunt. Watching these guys hunting Franklins and guinea fowl is quite something. Always enjoy watching them go about it. And you see, it's going back down... What is it doing? It's all of a sudden now just flown off. Let's see where it lands. Has it landed, Sense? Can you see it? Oh, here comes another one here. So the two of them are here together. There goes the other one kind of swooping in. Is the other one also sitting there? Okay, so there we go. They've just landed over there, both of them together. How cool is that? So that's the pair. Excuse the pole. Sorry about that. These poles are unfortunately a necessary evil in weather like this, but there the two of them are together. 
Very cool sighting though. That was absolutely epic. I thoroughly enjoyed seeing them as close as we did. They've obviously gone quite far now, so there's no ways that we're going to get anywhere near them, but we've got a very nice close-up indeed and quite low down. Often you find the hawk eagles sit quite high up. You can see there they've landed on quite a sort of tall dead tree, so not often you get them so low down to the ground like we just did. In fact, I haven't seen one like that in a very, very long time, as low down as where it was today. Good. Right, onward to Biffleswick Dam. We haven't even gotten there yet. So, Lulu Leopards, what is the largest type of raptor that we get around Juma? Well, that would be a lapid faced vulture, would be probably, or cape vulture, depending on whether you want to go with wingspan or weight. Um, so, lapid faced or cape vulture are the two of the uh, kind of bigger birds. If you're talking about birds that are not scavengers and just purely hunting birds, um, Marshall Eagle would be our biggest that would go. I, I mean, uh, technically, the the vultures um, have been recorded to hunt um, baby animals before and are not were strictly scavengers um, which Project Alpha actually let me know about the other day sent me a very interesting article about that but um, it's I, yeah I mean if you they're not that's not what they do most of the time so in terms of active hunting birds that spend most of their life hunting Marshall Eagle would be the biggest raptor but otherwise lapid faced and cape vulture if you depending on whether you want to wait or or wingspan size. Cape vultures, we have, don't get to see too many of them, unfortunately. You get them every now and then when we get a nice sized carcass. We had that, that epic sighting of three of them, or four of them, if I can't, can't remember correctly how many we had, but when we had that dead impala on quarantine and we had them all kind of coming in, it was re really amazing to kind of see them sort of landing. And just the sheer size difference between them and a white backed is unmistakable. You know, often people say that they look so similar and, and that it's very tricky to know the difference between them, but actually, um, when you see them next to one another, that cape vulture is just infinitely larger than um, the the white-backed. And there's our African hawk eagles again. They're kind of bouncing around along with us at the moment. So hopefully they'll lead us to a spotty cat, a spotted bird for a spotty cat. And actually their scientific name, I think, uh, forget the name now, it starts with an S. Spilo, Spilo, I think it's, I don't know, I'll remember it just now, but their, their scientific name is linked to their spots and is part of the reason why they got the name, actually, as far as I understand it. Right, Hosanna, where are you? Now, hold on. There's a few tracks around here that I want to have a look at. Not very clear because of the sort of road being so hard, but while we have a look at these, I'm going to send you back across to David, who I think is still with his lions, and I wonder if they're still showing interest in that wildebeest herd. Well, well done, uh, and finally, I got my ultimate prize for the day. I've been trying to locate the rest of the pride of the sausage tree and here they are all of them together I have counted three females here including the one that we saw hunting earlier and they got a meal and I was talking about this time around because of the migration is part of time will be zebras but more will be than the zebras so the one we see to the left there is munching or devouring uh, and I will be and the cubs I spoke about earlier. There they are, the two little beautiful cubs. Hello, that must be mum, I guess. Are you going to try and eat meat? Let's find out where you want to go. You can see the belly on that one. I would imagine a few pounds of fillet steak in her belly. So one of these will turn out to be what we call the kinktail. We saw the kinktail. And for those who have never joined us before, this particular pride of lions, we call it pride of lions rather. Yes, Cassie, thank you. And good to hear all of you saying the babies of these cubs are very cute as that one is trying to pull out. Not, what, not sure what part of flesh is that. We call this pride of lions or lionesses the sausage tree pride the sausage tree pride and we call them that because 
we have or they are very fond of climbing trees and in particular climbing a tree that we call the sausage tree because it has a wide trunk and the branches are equally big and smooth and comfortable for them. Lions are not known to climb trees so much like the leopards but this particular pride have been known to do that either to get away from the flies on the ground when we've got lots of flies or just looking for some shade up the tree and up the sausage tree and that's how we ended up calling this pride the sausage tree pride this one must have been full having eaten lots of meat I would guess much earlier so as I was saying before one of these three females will be the kink tail Because you'd find out now these are three and the other one we saw makes them four and having two cubs here it would mean maybe having lots of food with them but sometimes lions have or even any cat be it leopard or cheetah sometimes they have been known to take any opportunity that comes on their way wherever she was before we found her this will be just started running you know towards it and I think it a lot it will take advantage of that but if from what I saw and what we also grace the belly looked pretty fed it looked pretty good it had no reason to hunt but because the will be skim you know on her way she was like why not so what happens or normally if they have hunted and they're full they'll tend to conserve their energy but if there's a prey be it a wildebeest, be it a zebra that comes on, you know, on their way, they tend to go for it. And of course that would mean more food and they would even relax more knowing they have a lot of food in stock. You look at the belly on that one and the snooze she's having, she's just full and not thinking or worried of anything. I feel, you know, full of joy having gotten these two cubs. Mercy, I will say I'm sorry. I do not know the father of these cubs, but not far from where we are, Mercy, there is a particular coalition of lions uh, that is led by one big guy that we call Kipuli. It, consists of three males. Kipuli is the largest and two, I would say, sub-adult male. And Kipuli has been in charge of mating with the lions or with most prides around this area. So Masi, my guess would be Kipuli, but I will not say that for a fact as 100%. But chances are Kipuli possibly would have been the father of his cubs, Masi. I'm guessing they're three, four months old and unless something happens, Marcy and all the other nice viewers, I see them making it through to adults. You notice now it has gotten a bit dark where we are and we are in infrared and what that does make sure we do not affect or influence the behavior of these cats. Kept following Mama. How beautiful to see these bundles of joy and seeing them grow. I saw them about a month ago, well, three weeks ago, and it's good to see them doing very well. Don't stay very far from Mama. I'm assuming that's Mama. Kinky is one of the other lionesses in this pride, so I guess she's the one either laying down or on the other side, and not definitely the one who is so trying to stalk the wildebeest. See the belly of that one and you can see how she's breathing heavily being so full under that euphobia tree all uh, right oh just turning around and tossing knowing that they have enough to eat maybe they might think of a drink later but i think sydney got a different predator Oh, look at that you can see i've got a different predator now as i was coming back to the avoca look at that it think, seems like uh, this cat is fascinated by something you can see it's going very fast there so all we're going to do now is to try and follow so that we can see what is the main target 
But I can see that he is uh, indeed after something here. So I can see that he's concentrating going down uh, to the road. So we are going to see him just now. So he is slowly coming down this direction so the chances of having a better sighting they are very much high here so look at that so my apologies for the pole the weather it is still overcast so the rain is unpredictable so you can see that this cat is now slowly moving much more towards this direction and the positioning of the head is showing that he is looking at something. It's just that from here where I am, it's difficult for me to see it. But let's hope he's going to lead us to something. So by looking at the nose, it's very much difficult for me to tell which leopard is this one. I look at that now I can see because of the weather conditions the nose looks dark it's not pink at the moment look at that positioning you can see that he is slowly moving he is definitely up to something look at that he doesn't want to make any noise so let's hope he's gonna show us something here He's very much stationary and he's camouflaged. Looking at those grass, look at that. Look at that. But still I can't see where his target is. I can see where he's. The lion is roaring now. So this is happening now. Not very, not very far away from each other. The lion is roaring and the leopard is hunting I can see he's hunting a scrub hair I can see that scrub hair now is slowly moving much more towards that side the scrub hair is confused with the lion roar and has moved away so this cat is up to the scrub hair So the lion is not very far away from where we are at the moment. So the scrub here got disappeared now. So you can see now that he is uh, looking at the direction from where the roar is coming from. See that now he is slowly moving, he's still following. So you can see that he's still very much interested, although he has been distracted by the lion roar which moved that scrub hair. But I can see that this scrub hair is not seeing anything. between him and the scrub bear is now maybe uh, 20 meters but there's quite a lot of obstacles in between he won't easily access that scrub bear <laughs> James that is true uh, Osana is looking for a snack Let's see if he's gonna win. On top of the menu, we've got the scrub hair. So 
so the ears are moving all the time and I can see the scrub hair is very much stationary feeding not aware about the presence of this big predator at the moment so I'm just gonna try and see if I can free wheel so that we can see both at this big cat and the scrub hair So the scrub hair is right here. So the scrub hair is right there. I can see it's feeding right there in the middle of of this. I can see it right there. So you can see that scrub hair is feeding there, not aware about the presence of this big cat. And the cat is lying down right there. Right there we've got Hosanna looking at the scrub hair. Something might happen here, but the scrub hair is going much more deep. I can see he is raising up now because I can see the scrub hair is going deep. Maybe he's now thinking about an alternative approach direction. Uh, this is fascinating. You can see it's not easy for a predator to take down an animal. Look at the size of that scrub hair and this big cat, but still is it takes time he must have to follow all the steps and make sure that he doesn't get spotted the scrub is not aware about his presence look the scrub is stationary feeding and he doesn't want to make any mistake i'm very glad to see that hosanna is becoming very patient He is now enjoying the lion roar from the king of the jungle who is not roaring very far away from us. Listen to that. And that is what is confusing this scrub hair. Uh, the direction from where the lion is going from, I can hear that it's coming much more towards us. This leopard, how we spotted it, we were approaching the lion. As we were seeing the lion, the leopard was behind at a distance of about 200 meters. Look at that. that he is just making sure that he's behind the cover. I'm very much glad to see that Osana is now starting to understand that hunting activities takes time. Naturally, these cats can run very fast. They can run over 80 kilometers per hour. Look at that, look at that. You can see now he is going behind the cover and I can see the scrub here is right in between the bushes now. So that's why he is now moving the scrub hair is right in the middle of the bush and this scrub hair cannot see him coming. He is slowly approaching and the A very very good afternoon and welcome to the special broadcast I have got Osana here which is one of the young males in the area is a leopard now slowly approaching one of the scrub has is now behind the bushes anything might happen at any time now the distance between these two is just about less than 10 meters I Sydney uh, Fumurani Mikosi 
from the western side of the Great Kruger National Park, the Sabi Sand Juma Game Reserve. Look at that. You can see that this cat's positioning is about to chase a scrapper. When the cats are going after such small animals, you must know that they are very hungry. I can see the scrub bear came out there running very quickly. Now the scrub bear is running. It's now here by the open space. I'm sure the scrub bear managed to see this big predator slowly approaching. I saw the scrub bear coming too fast and I can see it's right here hiding behind this. I may see the scrub bear you will see it just now. It's just here behind me. The scrub bear came out running very quickly and the leopard is now disappearing. You can see right there, the scrub bear is just... That is the scrub bear this cat is trying to get hold of at the moment. Look at that. He's very much camouflaged at the moment and the cat went behind the bushes. So I'm not too sure if the cat decided to give up or he's still going to carry on coming. But I saw that the scrub here managed to spot the spotted cat. So you can see that this uh, scrub here, the focus is much more towards that direction. That is where the big cat is. Kathleen, the scrub hairs can be able to get camouflaged very easily and very quickly. Look at that. It's right by the big open space, but still it's camouflaged. But also the spotted cat got camouflaged somewhere in between these bushes. So both the prey and the predators, they are very camouflaged. One is using the predatory strategies, whereas the other one is using the anti-predatory strategies in order to hide. So you can see that the, the, the scrub bear is moving the ears all the time. <laughs> Nina, the chances of catching a prey are not very much easy. But mostly those kind of chances are motivated by what is in the stomach. When the predator is too hungry is when the chances of catching the prey are very much high because they are very careful. But when there is something in the stomach, the chances of catching a prey, they are very low because this kind of predators got to go very fast. And if there is something in the bellies, the weight also contribute towards the speed. So they don't run very fast. So now this scrub hair decided to run away and thank you very, very much for all your questions and comments. This is bringing us to the end of the special broadcast. Now I'm going back to the normal, normal game drive. So now let's go back to the Masai Mara where David is having some very interesting animals at the moment. I'm not too sure. Maybe David has got some cats. Well done, Sydney. And that was close hunting. And any time you see a leopard hunting, to me, it's not the same as lions hunting because more often than not, leopards... I would say maybe 99% chances are leopards hunt alone, but lions will always hunt in groups. We just saw one earlier, and for, well, hunting on its on her own, but in general you get two lionesses or two lions hunting three, sometimes four. Now, we're still sitting with the sausage tree pride, and for those who are joining us now, this pride of lions here is called the sausage tree pride and remember you're always welcome to ask us questions or send us any comments you may have on hashtag safari live and i've been looking for this pride the whole afternoon i earlier saw the one lioness but now three females or three girls are here with two small little cubs my guess is these cubs might be slightly over three months now because I saw them eating meat. You can see one 
sleepy sleepy on the far right the corner of the screen and there's another one right there so there's two of them from one of these females and in this pride of lions there's one particular female that we follow that we know very well and we can identify her a hundred percent because she got a kink tail hello there did you enjoy your meal so they have been feasting or devouring our wildebeest is it time to have a nap oh you look sleepy oops watch out watch out you're not in the best angle to sleep you'll never get sick of watching cats it's always fun to keep watching them I hope that was your question Well, Wendy, sorry, sorry, I missed your question. It's very difficult at the age of three months, Wendy, to know what sex they are. Wendy, sorry about that, but it's rather difficult to know what sex they are at this age. Anything, I would say, six months going to a year, that time you can always have an idea of what sex they are because the young males will start showing signs of growing men on their neck but as it is now it's very difficult to know my guess is they could be three or three and a half uh, months old we'll keep sitting here and find out if they might go back to their kill and start eating but in the meantime let's take you across to Sydney Well, no, not Sydney. Even though we're with the lion, it's not Sydney. So we thought we'd just quickly pop in now that Sydney's with Hosanna because this male's been roaring, apparently. Um, he's been making a bit of a noise. And of course, now that we're here, he's completely asleep and is in no way looking like he's going to make a single peep because that's just how he rolls, is he'll roar when we're not here. As soon as we arrive, then he's just quiet. It was the same story this morning. He roared, 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 roared. Then we got here and there was just a hush from him and nothing else. And now it looks as though he is fast asleep and not actually going to give us much at all. I'm quite surprised given he's been roaring. I would have thought if he was roaring that his head would still be up or that he'd even be on the move at the moment. But alas, he is back and fast asleep. Now you can see on his tummy, even though he's kind of you know, got a bit of a limp. There is a bit of a bulge there. I mean, you could do with more food than that, but it's not exactly empty, empty, empty. So there is a little bit inside there. So obviously he's managing to find food somewhere along the line. I don't know, did he actually feed off Tingana's kill last night at all? Because I went past there now and there's lots of bones and <coughs> bits and pieces at the base of the tree, but I'm not sure if anybody actually saw him feed on it at all. I don't think so. Maybe there wasn't anything left and he just sniffed around and then carried on. I don't, I don't know, but it would have been interesting if he had climbed the tree. I would have liked to have seen how mobile he is and whether or not he would have gotten up there because apparently he didn't go up the tree itself. But definitely there's no carcass left in the tree, so either it dropped to the ground and Tingana kind of finished everything and then left, or you know something else finished it maybe i you know kind of finished what was down on the ground itself but there's just some horns and legs there's a few bones there that i would have expected hyenas to kind of clean up if they were around so it's interesting i would be surprised if he didn't go and sniff about there maybe that's where he's got a bit of a belly from So Laurie, he already goes back and forth between them. Uh, he was seen, I confirmed during the day today, that he was seen with one of the other evokers and a female um, a few days ago on Biffle's Hook. So he's already in and out with them. Um, once his injury heals, whether or not he'll stay with them all the time, I don't know. But he might find that he'll kind of bounce between them and go from, you know, being with them and, and moving about and then he'll maybe go off particularly if there's females involved often when females are around these guys will kind of split off and go and mate with them and then come back again and there's a lot of movement that takes place well, he's got his eyes kind of open every now and then and then they close for a bit and then they open again and so I'm not sure if he's hearing something I wonder maybe if there's some other lions roaring in the distance which is sparking him to roar now we do see male lions sometimes roaring on their sides like this and birmingham's were great at it they often used to do it particularly when they were very full they just used to lie on their sides and make a lot of noise tinyo and mfumo um 
particularly. Uh, did I ever see Nena do it? No, Nena used to kind of sit with his head up and roar like that, and, and Nsuku uh, also, I mean, I didn't see Nsuku roar many times, if I'm honest, um, but he used to also seem like he used to keep his head up when he did it, but the other two regularly used to lie on their sides and have a, a big go at it. So even if he's lying like this, it's not, we can't write off a roar, but it's looking very unlikely that he's going to be too active at all. Come on, boy. It's Murphy's law, of course, that the time that there's no one here is that the time that he roars. It was the same this morning. He roared while we were driving at him. It's how we found him, is by his noise. Um, so we were on his tracks and then heard this roar coming from this area and, and then kind of found him like that. But as soon as we got to him, he was quiet. And then now he's been roaring, I believe, three times in the time it took us to get here. And now he's completely quiet. It's ridiculous. So Sudan, who is new to Safari Live, well, welcome Sudan, and welcome to the biggest vehicle that has many, many people on it every single day, and I hope that you'll enjoy your experience on Safari Live, and that you'll come back every single day and try and watch and see how the lives of our kind of cats evolve. But do you want to know how he was injured? I don't know. We're not sure. Um, these particular males... I'm fairly new to the area. Um, we don't know. We don't. We don't see them that regularly at the moment. They kind of come in and out and brief glimpses, and every now and then we see them. But it's not common that we get you know good views of them. Um, and so I'm not sure what's happened. It could have been a fight with his coalition members. So he he walks around with two other male lions that are you know that are around. Here we go. has got to be the most oddest roar that I've heard in a long time. I'm not sure what's this little extra bit that he adds to it, but either way, that was very, very cool. And so, like we were talking about, that they do sometimes roar on their sides, there's a perfect example of it. He's not even wanting to sit up, but he's happy to belt it out. But a very interesting type of roar. It's not this kind of how you often hear other lions roar. He's got a little kind of extra grunt towards the end of that sort of massive sound that comes out. And then there's even a bit of kind of growling that goes on in there. It was quite something, actually. He's got a uh, he's got a bit of a kind of artistic flair to him and his roar at this stage. But back to kind of what was wrong with his leg, we don't know. I mean, it could have been an injury from hunting buffalo. It could have been um, an injury from one of his coalition members. Like I say, he could have been injured when fighting with maybe some of the females. They've been trying to take over some prides. And so it's that foot there that's injured. You can see there's a bit of swelling around the sort of ankle area. Um, and that's the one that's giving him a little bit of trouble. You can also see on the leg itself a little bit of muscle dystrophy that's taken place because he's not using it as much. His muscle is not as developed as potentially the other legs. And so it will come back. I mean, he's already walking a lot better than what he was a few um, weeks ago. And so, you know, it will come right. These guys are super resilient and lions um, are come, can overcome all kinds of injuries that they have. And so, you know, I'm pretty sure that he'll be just fine and that he'll be okay and, and kind of figure it out and, and get him back into good condition. But how was that for a funny roar? That was very, very cool. I quite enjoyed his little sort of noise that he made and the way that he kind of <laughs> sort of grunted towards the end of each big kind of session. It was very, very funny to watch. It's not every day that you kind of see them doing that. And I don't know if maybe it's because he's lying down, there's a bit of extra air that's kind of coming through. Now, Mr. Public, you say evoke a paparazzi? Yes, well, the evokers, I suppose we're kind of going to sit here and enjoy it. And then is he'll 
will eventually be Pavarotti. Yes, I just realized that must be what you mean. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Do you think he would be a Pavarotti? I, uh, I don't think so. I think he's more like a you know, gangster rapper at this stage with his kind of little kind of a added extras here and there that he's got in there and, and it wasn't very in sync and in time and you know I think Pavarotti who is a magician in terms of his ability to sing would not be quite the same as what this gentleman just displayed either way it was highly entertaining I don't know if you watched though how his whole stomach kind of filled with air and then he just uses all of that energy to push it out and to make such an incredible sound it really is quite something when you sit here and you feel the car is almost vibrating as he roars like that but anyway at least we got him to roar which is always a good thing as you know we've been trying all day and so finally we managed to get it and for all of you to hear it it's that time of the day though where we're going to be saying goodbye though we are going to be doing a rehearsal this evening so we're going to be prepping for that for the next little bit and so it's been an absolute pleasure having you out this afternoon not that I contributed that much but Sydney and David certainly delivered the goods and it seems as though we've had lots and lots of interesting things that have taken place in this afternoon safari but from all of us it's been a great pleasure we'll see you all tomorrow morning for our sunrise safari <laughs>